Nathan, welcome to the Next Best Picture podcast. I'm Matt Neglia, and I am very, very excited to have you here uh, as the editor for the fourth installment of the John Wick franchise, John Wick Chapter 4. Nathan Orloff, how are you today? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. Uh, first thing I want to ask you in regards to John Wick Chapter 4 is you've never edited a film quite like this before. Um, you hadn't edited any of the previous films in the franchise from what I saw. So how did you come aboard the project this far deep into its franchise? Um, yeah, it was it was kind of a process. Um, Evan Schiff, who honestly coincidentally is a mentor of mine um, from my days at Bad Robot, he was... Um, he was not available for this project when, when they were started filming and, and Chad, I know had a extensive interview process. Um, and you know, um, my agent put me on a list and as well as a, a sound designer that I know the post executive, um, at Lionsgate knew, um, apparently recommended me. And so, um, and, and my interview with Chad, um, we just really hit it off. And, um, I later found out many, many months later when we were talking about it, he said that one of the reasons that he did like me and want to bring me on is because I don't have extensive experience in action he wanted he didn't want someone to come in and do their thing that they've been doing on other action movies he for lack of a better word i think wanted a blank slate of someone that would you know i you know i wanted to find the john mcfilm and find the style within the movie instead of sort of putting my own stamp on it in in terms of like how i if i had done other tons of other action movies before so it was something that it, it was very much a discovery process in this film of of how you know we wanted this film to to be and so um, he gave me a bunch of films to consider and look at and, 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 and study in terms of how they're done. And because John Wick, especially, I think is sort of an, you know, antithetical to how a lot of action movies are cut these days. And so he didn't want someone that was, um, you know, uh, going to sort of try to turn this into a typically cut action movie. I definitely can feel a sense of that when I'm watching the movie, especially given how four movies into this franchise, and I'm pretty amazed at how much weight and gravitas is given to the fourth chapter of this installment. The other films were more relentless, it felt like, in terms of their pacing, where with this one, there's a lot of room to breathe and to let the consequences of John's actions not only take hold of him, but also of the other characters, and they can feel those ramifications. So... I'm guessing that was probably an intention that you all sought out to do here was really feel the weight of John's journey up until this point. Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, you, you, you it's an insightful for you to, to recognize that, yeah, the other films are very much like, you know, the John is either on a direct rampage or running for his life. And, and this film was intentionally designed to be more reflective and contemplative that after three movies, after his entire career as a hitman he is forced to reckon with his past and what he's done. And, and that's why the sequence in Osaka is so important at the beginning is it's, it's almost like a mini version of um, it's all its own film almost in terms of he, at the end of it is realizing that, that his actions have these consequences, far reaching consequences. And what is the point, you know, both Koji and Winston ask, well, how does this end? And, and John doesn't have a good answer. And he doesn't come up with it until in the church with Donnie Yen, uh, when he is forced to literally duel with a, long, a lifelong friend. And it's this wonderful metaphor of consequences that has been, you know, pervasive and talked about in the entire series. But now we have to deliver, and and that was an intentional thing by both, uh, you know, in the script and by Chad and me to to meditate on what those consequences are, and so that we are with Keanu contemplating what it all means yeah and one of the things too that uh has been obviously heavily publicized up until this point is that at 169 minutes this is the longest john wick film uh to this date so you really had your hand um you really had your work cut out for you here in regards to how do you cut down a film that i'm sure the assembly cut was probably what four hours long more <laughs> three hours and 45 minutes Woo! Okay. yeah <laughs> So where does uh, yeah. one begin with, is this action scene going on too long? Where do we give the audience a breather? Can you walk us through being able to accomplish um, such a fantastic rhythm, but in a longer style of film? Uh, 
it was sort of a, it, you know, I look at it as sort of like, you know, sifting for gold and you just keep shaking, you just keep shaking. And, and the more we would watch these action sequences over time, over months and months, it became a little more obvious that, okay, that stun's not working as the one before and after it. How do we lift it out? Um, and there was one point, you know, um, I think my favorite sequence is the Arc de Triumph sequence. And there was one point, you know, we knew it was still too long. We knew there was still too much there. And um, Chad was like, you know what? Just I'm going to leave you alone. I'll see you tomorrow. Just make it car hit after car hit after car hit. And so I went through and then and and re- rearranged some things and and just made it so that it was just was boom boom. It just what is it? Because that to me is almost a joke in that scene of just it's bam. He's car. He's throwing people in the car. He's like, how do we do this so that the, the whole gag of the scene is that he's throwing people in the cars? So we just got to we just got to do it. And so you know, how do we cut around the the spacers in between? still make it completely clear and geographically, you know, um, followable. Cause that's a thing that I'm obsessed with is, is geography and clarity and action and not just, you know, cutting for the sake of energy. So, but how do you keep that energy and clarity and just make it entertaining and, and, and relentless. And that's another thing is in the, you know, the assembly, it's like we had these sequences, you know, especially the end where it goes from the Paris street fight to the Arc de Triomphe which kind of has those two sections, one, you know, with driving and one outside the car um, to the apartment complex, to the stairs. How do we want to make that flow as one? Cause as it came, as we assembled it, it became, it felt very clunky. Like there was this section. And so it was, to me, it became all about, you know, the DJ was essential to cut to the DJ, how the music changes, the needle drops go from this needle drop to score to a new needle drop to techno in the overhead shot and keeping these things all completely different, but back to back so that the energy was up, but there was dynamics in terms of um, you never felt the same. Can you talk to me a little bit about working with the sound team and also anyone that's in charge with the music on the film and how all of you collaborate together to formulate these sequences? Because one of the things that I really appreciate about the John Wick uh, films is the reoccurring use of the uh, John Wick theme throughout and how music usually will serve as a way to get an audience um, building an anticipation for what is to come in a fight scene or sometimes the lack of music, like in the climactic uh, scene of this film. Uh, So can you just talk to me a little bit about that collaboration process and what goes into that? I I felt um, music is a huge part of how I approach cutting. Um, I usually will cut action scenes, um, you know, uh, you know, cause music can be a crutch when assembling where you're cutting the scene to a piece of music that doesn't really belong. So I'll cut an action scene sort of, maybe I'll be having music on iTunes playing just like movie score. And then once I have the assembly of it done and I have a rhythm of it, then I put score to it and try to fit the score to this. I felt so incredibly lucky. And I honestly feel like I'm never going to run into this ever again is I had three films of score behind me on this film and not just score. I had all the stems. So I was able to take a stem from John Wick one, pair it with a different stem from a different track in John Wick three, create something completely new as our temp score, but it was all John Wick. It was all Tyler Bates and it really informed Tyler obviously did come in and, and, and take what we did and make it, a new John Wick four thing, but we really nailed the tone more than any other film. I, you know, I feel like I'll ever work on again, our temp score that, that I made with, along with Nicholas Lundgren, um, my assistant and additional, uh, really nailed the tone of each scene. And, and it didn't change and the tone of the score never changed really. We just made it new and, and, and of this movie. Um, and so that was a huge part of that. Uh, Jen Malone, the music supervisor, was wonderful in providing um, scores and tracks and ideas for things. You know, I, there was there was times where uh, you know we wanted to be wacky and crazy, and I found a random old French song from the '60s that I thought would be a very like, wait, what's going on? And then it turns into the the radio inside the subway, um, and as a way to really force you to think about, oh, there's a radio here, which was a setup for the DJ. Um, and so it was a big collaboration um, between all of us. And there was stuff that even Nicholas, my, my, my additional found um, that is in the movie for final that are distracts that, that 
um, you know, heavily inspired how we how we approached the scene. And so it was it was a very collaborative effort. And along with sound too, they they were instrumental, especially in the Arctic Triumph sequence, where it was so busy and so there's so much going on that we really needed help bringing stuff in to, to make that scene work when the when the VFX looked like, you know, when they were like a PlayStation 2 graphics level, you know, it's sort of like the sound helped sell that scene. So how do you avoid repetition? Because John is just dispatching henchmen left and right at times. And you have these incredibly well thought out, planned and executed stunts. There's so much work going into the actual shooting. So in the editing room, I'm sure there's so much on the cutting room floor that we didn't get a chance to see that people poured their blood, sweat and tears over. But for the sake of trying to avoid repetition, can you just talk to me about the decision making process that goes into we're going to leave this kill in? But we got to have this kill go. No, totally. And there was definitely sometimes if, if a kill was too similar to something else, we would pick one. Um, but you know, going back to music was probably is a huge thing with that, and sort of creating different tones and, and and alternating what we were doing with music to avoid the things feeling the same. And and to Chad's credit, structuring the movie, especially in those and that and last forty five minutes when it's going from a, a street fight to a car to then the overhead shot when you're like, okay, I've been watching action now for 30 minutes and now I'm seeing something I've never seen before. That was such a brilliant decision on his part to avoid action fatigue. Um, and I'm, I'm very proud of how that seems. And then you get to the stair fight and it's also something that's, that's crazy. And, and then when he falls down all the stairs, you, I've never seen anything like that. And so um, it's just, uh, it was a real treat and a blast to work on um, to try to live up to making all those sequences feel as unique as they really are. I want to ask about that overhead shot in particular, because there there was a point where my brain realized, oh my God, this shot has been going on for seemingly a couple of minutes and I didn't even realize it. But then it does cut and you do, I don't, I don't remember what it cuts to exactly, but then it goes into another overhead shot. Um, so can you just tell me, was it always meant to be one shot, but there was something missing and you had to have a transition like cut away to something else? Or like, how did that decision come about to kind of have a break between the two long overhead shots? Um, it actually, it was not intended to be one shot. Um, I think Chad, you know, he would say it himself, nothing screams excess like excess. <laughs> uh, and that's just sort of his style in terms of like the whole point in John Wick sometimes is, is, Oh my God, this, this is going on for a long time. He's killing so many people. Like you're supposed to be exhausted with Keanu as a viewer. And that was a, that was a tricky thing to always balance because there's exhaustion and then there's checking your watch. Um, and that idea of the second shot was supposed to be like, and we're doing it again. You know, it's just very much, it's very much supposed to make you laugh and smile. And, and, you know, you thought it was done, but it's not. Okay. I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, tell me, what was the hardest scene to cut in this movie? Um, I think the Archer Triumph sequence. The That was a very, very tricky sequence because all of the stunts are real. All the car hits are real. What Keanu is doing is all real. Wow. The background is not. And so, and then these car hits, the, the cars they used was either cars with um, big pads in the front or they had these big sleds that had like fake headlights on them with pads. So it was all about replacing the background and replacing the cars. Um, and so editing that is, it was very much like, uh, it, you're just like, is this going to work? Like, I'm just, I was just doing my best to sort of have this, I, this that's how this, I think this should fit. Um, but it was so much like, um, you know, kind of throwing it to the effects to see um, what it was going to turn into. And so, and especially geographically, cutting that was hard because like I said, they just saw it in like a tarmac. And so it was just like the, ba the background is what they replaced. Um, and uh, it, it was very, I was very satisfied as it started to come together that when the background was in, that you were actually now tracking the geography of where everybody was um, and, and honing that in and making sure that the clarity of the scene was, was there was very tricky. Chad comes to you and says, Nathan, we are going to replicate one of the most famous cuts in cinematic history in the first couple of minutes of this movie. What is your reaction when you hear Chad say this? Um, I, I remember it vividly. <laughs> I went to set that day in Paris. 
Uh, and Chad loves, to, especially at the beginning of a relationship, he kind of loved to like quiz me and throw questions about cinema history because um, he would tease me at my age. Um, and he was like, all right, what's the most famous cut in all of cinema? And I actually nailed it. And he was very, I think I was like, okay. And then I was like on his, like, he's knew that like we were going to get along. Cause it was actually kind of in the beginning of the, uh, of the shoot. Um, and I, you know, I was, I was showing, I was talking to him when I, you know, he was setting the shot up and I was like, oh, so you're going to do, it's going to be an, a push in. And I was like, well, the original was a static profile shot. He's like, I know we're going to do it. We're going to do it our way. And I was like, <laughs> I love it. I love it. It was very, you know, daunting. And I, you know, and I did study the original one. I wanted to make sure we did the exact number of frames when the fire was blown out before cutting to the sunrise. Um, you know, I wanted to make it, you know, do it justice. I mean, like, even as someone who didn't know that it was coming, the minute I saw it, I was like, oh, the audacity. I love it. Yeah, that. that's I what I was like. Love it. I was like, I was like, oh, my God, people are going to give us so much shit for this. No, no, no. I just looked at it as this film is telling us right out of the gate, prepare, because what you're about to watch is going to be something as epic as <laughs> Lords of Arabia. <laughs> no, totally. Absolutely. And that's and that's something I, I, I one of the things I love about this movie is that, you know, and to Chad's credit, you know, told me early on that, like, you know, especially with the script and it has like different, there's multiple protagonists and we're cutting, we're doing things that the John film has never done before. And, and he told me, he's like, I'd, I'd rather swing in a mess than do the same thing over again. And I just, I just, I love that attitude and approach to a film because that's how you do something new. And you're absolutely right. This, that, that match cut uh, is indicative of like us saying to like the audience, like what we're going for, you know, and that sets up like how, you know, the end we're doing, the, you know, good, bad, and the ugly, you know, um, you know, one of the reasons I loved putting the cross dissolve from the map into the Arc de Triomphe is like, to me, it was like, this map that they have here is very Indiana Jones. And so I like, we're just like throwing all these things. There's a velociraptor beat where the dog comes out of the shadows and, and, uh, and attacks a guy. There's all these homages in the film to me, like just cinema we love. And it's just, uh, it's Chad, I think, you know, just really honoring his roots and what influenced him. I love that. Yeah. There's so many references, like you said, that each time I watch it, I'm always picking up on something new here or there. Um, I asked you what was the hardest scene to cut. Um, let's end on a positive note. What was the most fun scene to cut? Oh, I think the most fun scene to cut was the Louvre with Winston and the Marquis. Mm -hmm. You know, the two performances there, the power dynamic, the struggle. It's so beautifully shot. Um, it's very much... Um, just so flat on and straight. And it was very difficult. It was, it was, it was a little difficult to cut, but it was such a pleasure because, because Bill Skarsgård and Ian McShane are just, just powerhouses of, of acting talent. And uh, I just adored working on it. It was such a pleasure. And, and I, I just love this. this, this like, you know, you, you know, like you're saying that earlier, there's this, give some of these scenes room to breathe. Cause to me, it was, it, m it makes them land better. We're not rushing through scenes just to rush through them. And there's these moments holding on Bill Skarsgård and then he just like cracks and smiles a little bit. And you see in that moment, his weakness. Um, and, and that was so much fun. I love that. Yeah. I especially love to Winston just walking into the room and how long the camera <laughs> yes. was him walking in. Yeah. It's fantastic. Uh, all around, uh, this is pound for pound, one of the best action movies I think I've ever seen. I think you guys hit some incredibly new heights with John Wick Chapter 4. And I'm praying, I'm hoping that there is a final chapter or maybe more to come beyond that. I don't know. But I would hope to have you back because I really think that this film stands above the rest. And a large reason for that is because of your work. So thank you for that very, very much. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. It really means a lot to me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Can you tell us what you have coming up next? Um, yes, I'm working on the next Ghostbusters movie, um, uh, directed by Gil Kennan, and uh, I'm very excited. Actually, I'm, I'm leaving for London today. That's amazing. Great. Yeah. I mean, I, if I remember correctly, you worked on Afterlife. Yes. Yes, I yes. did. Yeah. So yeah, there you go. I love that you were that you're being brought back for that. That's awesome. All right. Well, I'm very excited. Yeah, best of luck to you on that, and thank you so much for the time here. And I highly urge everyone that's watching this to go watch John Wick Chapter 4 for a third, fourth, fifth, however many times you were going to go see it. Thank you so much, Nathan. Thank you. I appreciate it.